Hey everyone, my name is Michael Stipe. And today I want to have a look at how we can build a layered GraphQL server when using data loader in the business layer. I already did a couple of episodes on our new data API and also on data loader itself. And today we're going to take it further and look at how we could move things around and have clear layers without dependencies on our GraphQL libraries. If you want to have the source code of this episode or any other episode, head over to tv.chillycream.com. If you like our content, please hit the like and subscribe button below the video. Let's get started. I already have here a project prepared. That's our webshop or eShop project, which we branched off of the Microsoft eShop. And at this point, it just is concerned with three entities here, which is product, brand, and product type. The product type is basically the category. The brand is the brand of the product and each brand has many products and one product has a single brand. Okay, that's the basics here. We already built it in a way that it's layered. So we have here the types folder, which is GraphQL. Everything in here is built around GraphQL. Then we have here our services folder, which contains all our business logic. Each of the services is built around an entity, so roughly large services, which is not ideal for GraphQL, but uh, we're gonna run with that, right? Um, ideally, you build very small uh, services that just do a single thing. Then we have here models, and then are our business models. We also have entity types, which uh, live in our data layer, and the data layer is basically entity framework. So what we're gonna do is create two additional projects here, one for the data layer and one for all our business stuff, right? And then we make sure that we don't have any GraphQL logic in our business layer and uh, have clear boundaries between these layers. There are multiple iterations that you could do or make it more or less complex with different patterns around that. For instance, you could use clean architecture, which would have a different project structure. But let's go ahead with that and let's build some projects. So the first one I'm going to create here is the data project. And then we create the services project. Okay, let me add that to our solution. With that, let's do a quick reload to have everything added to the context. And then we're going to dive in here. So the first thing I want to do is move out the data layer. So to move out the data layer, we got to add a couple of libraries here. Since our data layer is built on entity framework, we are just going to copy over the entity framework libraries to our data project. Awesome. So ideally I could use here something neutral, but I'm just building with Postgres at this point. So I don't worry about, as I said, you can make that more complex, but for now it's more about the principles, right? So we're going to drag just this folder, everything in this folder over here. We're going to leave the migrations actually up here because they are just uh, for demo purposes there anyway, to fill up the database with some demo data. So I'm not worried to have that complexity actually here in our data layer. So this thing looks already fine. We have to import a couple of things or use really the implicit usings here. So we can grab a couple of these, put them over here and then strip them down. So what we want to have is the data stuff. Actually, the data stuff is not needed because we will be in that namespace. Let's have a look at our code. Now it looks much better. There is no more any issues here. Regarding dependencies, let's actually build that. So we actually have here now errors, and that's because our API project doesn't know where our data layer lives. So we're going to add here actually some dependency injection logic, like an extension method add data layer. So we're going to add here a new folder or extensions, and then we're going to add an extension class for the DI. So we add that to the namespace uh, of the Microsoft DI container here. And then we're gonna grab actually what we have here in our API project in the program CS. You can see here is our setup. We're not worried about the data migrations, but this part here, we're gonna take, then we're gonna copy here. Okay, next thing is we just reference these two projects. Let me do that quickly. And then we are good to go. This is our data layer, it works. And uh, this had so far nothing to do with data loader or GraphQL. It's just basically uh, moving out the data layer here. Okay, let's start with the next thing. 
and that is moving the business layer parts over. So that's the models and the services folder. I'm gonna just copy it in here. And then we are also defining here quickly the namespace and the assembly name. Next, let's also grab the implicit imports. I'm taking over these three here and let's kick that out. And let's now see what's broken and then fix it. So there's a lot of errors here around our primitives that we have in Green Donut, like paging arguments, query context, and so forth. There is a way also to live without these. Then you have to craft them yourself and do a lot of mapping. We're not going to do that and to keep these primitives around. So what we need here as a reference in this case is really the green donut primitives. These primitives are in the package green donut data primitives. So let's compile that actually with these new things in place that we still have here errors. You can see the data loader attribute because in this case, we are also generating our data loaders as part of this service layer. We could also generate them as part of our data layer or have them as a separate layer. But in this case, I will keep them here as an internal component of our business layer. I don't want to have it exposed and I don't want anybody to see the interfaces or see that we are using data loader, but uh, we're going to generate them in here as internal components. So to do that, we also need here actually the full green donut package and also the full green donut data package. So we're gonna add here actually the green donut package. And then we also gonna add the green donut data package. And actually in this case, it's not worse to have the primitives package in here because the data package actually references the primitives. So these two things we're gonna add, let's regenerate. And then we still have a couple of errors, do you see here? So let's have a look at why that is. So we have this error here that we are missing the namespace and that's because our code was using implicit imports before. This is enabled here. And while implicit imports are actually used here, the implicit imports came from hot chocolate. So in our case, we just gonna add them here and then we recompile. So we have here a couple of errors around entity framework. And what we're gonna do is first also add here the entity framework data package, that's the driver, since our data layer is entity framework. And then we also add a couple of entity framework packages here. Awesome, I added these two here, and then we're gonna rebuild. We still have uh, three errors here. One is that I brand data loader is not there, and also a couple of other data loaders are not there. If you remember, like we used a source generator here to generate these data loaders. And uh, we're gonna add the same source generator and the source generator is actually a hot chocolate source generator, but we can configure it to only produce green donut code. The data loader itself is not a runtime uh, reference. So let's quickly go here to our RAFQL project and you can see this is like the entity framework tools. It's not part of the artifact that you produce, right? So we're gonna take this here and just add it. If you're building with GraphQL, you need the right support to stay ahead. The Chili Cream support plans give you direct access to our experts, priority bug fixes, and even a say in our roadmap. So you can shape the future of the tool you are relying on. Check out the options to find the right fit for your team. And with that, let's go back to the problem at hand. So the reason why we don't have two source generators is because you cannot have two source generators producing code and then use this code uh, from the other source generator. In essence, source generators cannot see the code that another source generator produces. So that's why we created a single source generator that produces all the code that we need and is configurable to uh, produce hot chocolate code or produce just green donut code. So I've referenced that here, let's build it. And this now complains that we don't have hot chocolate references here. So what we're gonna do is define that this is actually a green donut module, so it should not contain any hot chocolate code. So how do we do that? Typically we have here a properties folder and within these properties folder, we create a simple code file 
we call the module info. And within the module info, we put an assembly attribute. And in this case, the attribute is called data loader module. And we give this data loader module a name here. And I'm calling that the catalog data loader. And just by adding this attribute here, we are now compiling and producing just a green donut data loader. So I'm gonna quickly reconfigure this project so that we can see here in VS Code the code of the source generator being outputted. The project is now reconfigured and you can see now every time I build, I have here a generated folder. This is ignored code. So it uh, will not compile in any way. It's just here. So we see what the source generator produces. And what you can see here is that it's just producing green donor data loader files, right? We only reference here green donor packages and we also just generate green donut code. But at the moment, uh, you can see that we have here public interfaces, public classes, and we also produce here public dependency injection code. So what we want to have actually is all this stuff internal. So let's start actually with the data loader itself. We don't want the data loader itself being public. So we're going to add another attribute here, and this is called data loader defaults. And in the defaults, that's for generating the data loader, the defaults, we can say we want to change the access modifier to only have internal pieces. So we only have internal interfaces, internal classes. We also could say we want to have a public interface or whatnot. But in this case, let's say we just want to have internal components. So let's rebuild that. And then we get a lot of errors because we are using these interfaces in the constructor, which is public. Now we have a problem with these services. But let's not worry about that. Let's have a look at the data loader code. And you can see that is now internal, internal. So this is pretty good. But the DI is still public here. And ideally, we don't want to have this as a public component. So we go back here to the module info. And here on the data loader module, we can actually say this is an internal module. That's always good if you want to have your own DI method that wraps actually this method that this module produces here. So I'm saying that I want an internal module and we rebuild that. And then we have here an internal extension method, right? Okay, let's put the pieces together. So we could do a couple of decisions here. Either we want to have a public data loader interface, but we want this to be our own interface. This is possible. We could produce that. It's a bit more work, but I uh, let me quickly show you that. So before I show you that, it's important to note that the classes are always generated partial. This has a reason because we want you to be able to add things into it, like Maybe you want to have a different method, not load. You want to call it get uh, by ID or whatever. Then you can create your own interfaces for this and then implement a partial part of this that implements that interface. Second thing is you cannot just add data loaders on their own. They will not work. You must use our DI injection method here, this add data loader. Otherwise, they will not batch. They will only work like if they are cache data loaders. So immediately dispatch. And they also will have a lot of the features not being enabled. So we want to use this, but we might want to use uh, our own interfaces. And I'm going to show you a quick example how to register that with the EDI and how to set that up. And let's do that for the brand service here. We have here iBrand by ID data loader here. Uh, and we could, for instance, introduce a new interface here, which we call iBrand Batch Loader. I'm not very uh, creative with the names, but anyway. And then this has basically a task, produces a brand, and let's say get a brand async. So very basic, right? We're going to pass into that an ID and the cancellation token. Awesome. So this is our interface. This is our own interface that we're going to use. And we could use it up here. And then we would have here the get brand async method, right? So in order to use that with our data loader, we're going to do a public partial piece of our data loader, right? And uh, we're going to use this brand by ID data loader. And then we just say we're going to implement that here. Okay, I get here the, the red squiggles because it's public. It actually has to be internal. And then we can basically just wire that through. So how can we make uh, this interface work now with the DI if we have to use 
the DI generated code that we have. So this is pretty easy. We just introduce here our DI code. So I've created here quickly a DI extension class. And what we could do here is basically just say, add the data loader module. So we add this, and then you just bind the interface to the existing data loader. So in this case, we would say add scoped, it must be scoped. Then you take your interface and then in here you have basically a delegate. Say you want to get a required service and then you just take the batch by ID data loader in this case, and then you're done. This is how you can get rid even of the data loader interfaces, use your own and have just the data loader code isolated somewhere, right? Okay, in our case, we're not gonna do that. We actually use the interfaces. Okay, I rewired that to use the generated interface here. What you can decide still on is if you wanna have public interfaces, internal implementation. In my case, I'm going with the internal internal approach here. So we're gonna just use here a regular constructor and then make this internal. And then we can set that up here in our service layer DI method. These are also scoped, brand service. So I've rewired here everything. Let's kick this connection string actually out. We don't need that, that's in the data layer. And then we can actually rebuild that and it's green, it builds now. And as I said, we don't have any hot chocolate dependencies here, apart from the source generator, but this, as I said, is not really a dependency, it's a generator and it will only be there at build time. So let's rewire our API project. There's one thing missing here. We need first to kick out the services stuff and also the models. Awesome, this is out. We now have here an error in the program CS. We're gonna kick these out and we're gonna say add services layer. We don't have that yet because I haven't referenced the project. So let's quickly do that. Let's rebuild. It builds with errors, that's okay. We can go here and now we can say add service layer and now it should build without error. That's good. Let's start the project. It runs, let's try it out. Let's run this query here and we get an error. Okay, let's have a look at what the error actually is. A suitable constructor for the brand service is not available. I know what this is. It's because we have internal constructors and the DI will not just take them. Okay, let's uh, rewire that. So we could use an attribute here in the service to mark the constructor that we wanna have. We can also just quickly use here a factory style. So I quickly fix that here. Now I use this factory style with the delegate to create the service. Let's restart this thing. We go over here, we run it and it works. So this is now the same service that we had in the last episode, actually, where we layered it into these folders. But this time we have actual layers in the sense that we have separate projects where we don't have a reference on actually hot chocolate. With this, we are also at the end. Chime out in the comments what you think about our new capabilities in the source generator that you can now generate completely isolated code, which has no dependency on hot chocolate. And also you still have all the capabilities that I showed you in the last episode, where we introduced filtering projections and all these things to the Green Donut Data API. I hope to see you next time.